time has come. I'm nervous, let me tell you. <laughs> Hello guys and welcome back to my channel. Today's a big day. Today is the finale of the bag collection series. I believe this will be a two or three parter depending on how fast I managed to talk today. We are finally covering the brand you have been requesting since the very beginning, Louis Vuitton. Now Louis Vuitton has been around since the dawn of time. So this history lesson is going to be a little more wordy. And because it is the brand I have collected from for the longest, loved for the longest maybe even. Since I was very young, I had an appreciation and a recognition for the brand. So that's definitely re reflected around the, the moat of bags surrounding me right now. I hope you will appreciate and still like the speedier pace of today's video. And without further ado, let's get cracking into the history of Louis Vuitton. So in 1821, Louis Vuitton was born in a small town in France uh, to a farmer and a milliner, and it didn't take him long to realize his big dreams and aspirations. At the age of 16, he made the decision to walk from his hometown to Paris. Walk from his hometown to Paris. 292 miles, by the way, uh, to go pursue his dreams, and he quickly became an apprentice to a successful box maker and packer called Monsieur Maréchal. Already he was learning his craft of making durable containers and how to pack them properly. Now in 1854, after years of perfecting his craft and learning everything he could from Monsieur Maréchal, Vuitton ventured out and opened his very own shop on Rue Neuve des Capucines. That's right, Capucines. And that is where he began to establish himself as a luggage maker. In 1858, he designed his first steamer trunk. Um, now at the time, steamer trunks usually had a rounded hood and what differentiated his designs is that they were flat. So they were easier to stack, easier to travel with more than one. They were waterproof. He gained popularity pretty quickly. The first trunks didn't have the monogram. They were gray canvas and the monogram didn't actually see life in Louis Vuitton's own lifetime. After years of success, he did start to experiment with patterns on the trunks. Uh, the, one of the patterns is the demi print, which we're still very familiar with the little squares. And he also had a striped print that we don't see so much in the bags anymore, but there was a collection recently that kind of alluded back to those lines. Also, the patterns were hand-painted because even back then, um, that was the only way to differentiate them from counterfeits. That's right, folks, even in the late 1800s, <laughs> Louis Vuitton uh, represented enough of a status symbol to warrant counterfeiting. Also in 1886, his son George, who would soon take over the brand, invented locks that were impossible to pick uh, because that was a common practice at the time. That lock is still used today. Now in 1892, uh, Louis Vuitton passed and passed on the company to his son George. And in honor of his late father, George came up with the LV logo with the quatre fois and the flowers, uh, kind of as a little memoriam, quickly garnered so much attention, uh, became very popular, especially with celebrity clientele. Even this, this woman named uh, Gabrielle Chanel was a big fan. In 1925, a dome-shaped handbag that was meant for personal use rather than travel was created just for Chanel and it wasn't reproduced for others until 1934. You might know the bag as the Alma now. If you own an Alma, it's, I mean, you just got a lot of street cred if you ask me. And with the success of its smaller goods, Louis Vuitton started producing more everyday bags from the Speedy to the Keep All to the Noé. All of those bags that we still buy to this day were created back in the 30s. Now in 1936, George passed away and his son Gaston took over the brand. So they really kept it in the family for a very long time. During Gaston, I think his name was Gaston Louis, which is kind of crazy because my grandfather's name is Gaston and my father's name is Louis. So, I mean, there's no wonder I love this stuff. So he had about a 50 year tenure, I believe, and he created even more iconic bags, some of which incorporated leather components and really capitalized on that traditional LV logo, uh, like the Papillon, if you guys know that cylindrical bag, that was Gaston's doing. Now, this is where things get interesting on a business front. When Gaston passed in 1970, his son-in-law Henri took over the company with a goal of really expanding. They actually went public with the company in 1980 and really opened stores globally. Being that Louis Vuitton was the leader in luxury goods, uh, they aligned themselves with a very famous cognac brand, a very famous champagne brand, and thus LVMH was created. The major conglomerate we know it to be today in 87. Isn't that crazy? It feels kind of young. Now the 90s was a pivotal era for Louis Vuitton. There was a hundred year anniversary of the Damier print. And of course in 97, they hired their first creative director, little known guy, Marc Jacobs. Now side note, Marc Jacobs at Louis Vuitton was like my first love partnership between between a brand and a designer. He was the first to do ready to wear for Louis Vuitton in 1997 also, by the way. Isn't that crazy to think that they didn't have ready to wear until 1997? The collaborative nature of Marc Jacobs also really benefited the brand because he partnered with, well, we know to this day, so many artists. But at the time, Steven Sprouse was the first collaboration with the graffiti bags, one of the most sought after collections of all time from the house. But following the success, by the way, I'm sorry, I love pockets. That collaboration, LV aligned itself with another well-known artist in 2003. His name is Takashi Murakami. And oh my God, those bags were legendary. Those 
multicolored monogram bags were the it bag for years to this day. They hold such a special spot in my heart. I have a few in my collection I can't wait to share with you guys. Of course, the multicolored print wasn't the only that they collaborated on. They also did the Smiling Cherry Blossoms and the Smiling Cherry. As Louis Vuitton sales continued to soar in 2007, uh, they, they created their most popular bag of all time, now known as the Neverfull. Fun fact about the Neverfull, by the way, even though it has super thin straps, apparently you can carry up to 200 pounds. Greg Jacobs left uh, Louis Vuitton in 2013. One of his last designs is another one that stood the test of time, the Pochette Métis, which is one of my personal favorite bags from Louis Vuitton. It was inspired by like a Monceau briefcase. And after Marc Jacobs' departure, you have Nicolas Gersquière's arrival to the house. By the way, I pronounced it Gersquière for like the whole time. Just now, it's smooth J, everyone, just FYI. So Nicolas didn't only decide to foster the heritage of the brand and its well popular and loved bags, but also pushed the boundaries and created a lot more of our favorites to this day. From the twist to the capucine, he was coming from Balenciaga, so he really brought a little bit of an edge. And thanks to Nicolas Gersquier's success at the house, Louis Vuitton went ahead and appointed a new avant-garde creative director for their men's line, replacing Kim Jones, another beloved of mine. Uh, by the name of Virgil Abloh, who brought with him a whole new generation of fashion lovers and hype beasts to the house, which promises that Louis Vuitton is not going anywhere anytime soon. I hope you guys enjoyed my little Cliff's Notes version of Louis Vuitton's almost 200 year history. Uh, today, I'm gonna try to cover the older bags. So things from the Marc Jacobs era, some Steven Sprouse pieces, some Takashi pieces, and then in part two, I will do kind of the Nicolas era. Well, I don't really know how I'm organizing it. We'll see how far I get. All right, so I figured we should start with my first. First, uh, speaking of the papillon, my first Louis Vuitton bag was this tiny little circular cylindrical papillon bag. To tell you that the day that I got this was the happiest of my life might not be uh, an <laughs> overstatement. I had been worshiping Louis Vuitton ever since I was probably like under 10 years old. My mother had a bag and I knew it was a special bag. And over the years she collected a few more and I couldn't wait till the day that I finally got my hands and I became a grown up, a young lady and could have my own. This was of course a gift. My mom bought it for me at the fifth, um, Fifth Avenue location. And yeah, happiest day of my life for sure. Uh, this cute little guy. I would never part with it. I don't, I never wear it. I think I'd be scared too, honestly. It just has such a special place in my heart. I don't know, it brings back a lot of like warm and fuzzy memories. I don't know if I'm emotional because it's like the end of this journey where I'm like sharing such an important thing to you guys. But uh, yeah, a lot of warm and fuzzy feelings tied to this one. And uh, definitely probably one of my most cherished uh, bags and memories. By the way, I should preface this by saying that as a collector, Louis Vuitton is, of all luxury brands in the world, probably the one that has the most incentive to collect. Yeah, that was me trying to trying to excuse this obtuse amount of bags around me. Speaking of collectible bags, I feel like I'm really starting with a strong one-two punch right now. More sweeping statements. This is a bag that I've wanted or that I wanted at the time more than any bag I've ever received or purchased in my life. The amount of lust and love I had for this Takashi Murakami multicolored Speedy and knew no bounds. I I recall crying over this bag because I wanted it so bad. Like that's how deep the cut was. And to say that I still worship it would not be an overstatement. I spoke about it in the history briefly. This was the first collaboration that Louis did with Takashi Murakami. They did it in the black and the white. Um, oh my God, I actually have a little one from the black that I got before this one kind of an introductory piece. So I actually received this little pochette. I think this was my second Louis bag ever. Uh, also got it at the Fifth Avenue store in New York. I also remember this day very well. Uh, I feel like this bag is so trendy now. I don't know why I don't pull it out more, but it's got the little studs on the strap and little studs under the zipper over here. I prefer the white with the colorful monogram than the black. So I'm surprised that I went with black originally, but maybe I was in a little bit of a moody phase. I don't know. So yeah, this bag was my, my fable creature, my lost arc. Uh, and when I received it, I, I wore it for three years. I slept with it. Probably one of my most worn bags throughout the years. The hardware is definitely a little scratched here and there, but it's a bag that I worship to this day, uh, one that will never leave my collection. Speaking of multicolored, last piece I promise from the multicolored, <laughs> uh, multicolored Takashi Murakami era. Uh, this little clutch I bought for my cotillion in high school. Looking back, I feel like I was much cooler than, than I am now. I wore this with a pink satin D&G dress that Sophia Bush had worn that I loved shape is very, very reminiscent of the era as well, like the early 2000s. Early 2000s? Maybe 2004 or five. And uh, yeah, so this is my little multicolored Takashi Murakami trifecta, and I intend on taking them with me to the grave. No, just kidding. Hopefully my son or daughter really likes this colorway. Future 
son or daughter. So another Takashi Murakami piece that I worshipped and was so excited to get my hands on is this smiling cherry bag. Uh, I missed the boat on the cherry blossoms and it haunts me to this day because I grew up watching Buffy the Vampire Slayer religiously. Sarah Michelle Gellar was my idol for many, many, many years. She still kind of is. I hope to meet her one day, but I think I'll just sob. <laughs> and she went to the Teen Choice Awards in probably 2002, 2003 with the Pepillon version of the cherry blossom bag. And to this day, I am looking for it on the pre-love market. So if you guys find it for me, please put it in the comment box below. I will buy it. But yeah, that was my dream bag. So when I heard that Takashi was releasing another cherry themed collection, I knew I needed a piece from it. The Speedy felt like a no brainer. It's a smaller Speedy. Also, if you are a big collector, I feel like a Speedy is a great statement from each collection because they always reinvent it in such a clever way. Like recently the Game On collection with the big card stamp on the side. Um, imagine having a Speedy from every iconic collection. I would die. I would just stare at them like museum pieces. But yeah, this is another really special one. Got this one in Ball Harbor in Florida at the Sox. I remember where I got all of these bags. Like I, it was years ago. The experience is still legendary in my eyes and I have so much reverence for all of these all of these little wonders so another great Takashi Murakami piece now while we're talking about uh, artist collaborations figured I would mention this little Steven Sprouse neon flower bag I think it was Mary Kate or Ashley Olsen wore I love the Louis Vuitton scarves the lightweight ones and the leopard print that Steven Sprouse did is still my favorite to this day my mother and I fight over which color we own actually should I do this just for jokes one moment please so, I don't know if you see them back here, <laughs> but my mom and I have collected those Steven Sprouse LV scarves over the years, and we always fight over which colors are hers and which colors are mine, and then she comes to my house, she steals them, I go to her house, I steal them back. It's been a really, really fun game that we've played over the years. But this is my only bag from Steven Sprouse. I love the neon colors. I don't have a lot of neon colored anything in this closet, so this actually comes in quite handy here and there. I love the rose motif. I'm someone that loves the floral, but this special pop of color always felt really, really special to me. I remember the day I bought this one as well in Montreal, and I was, uh, I think it was after a boozy lunch. I feel like that's a running theme <laughs> in this little series. I feel like like I tend to, be, I'm a drunk shopper, everyone. So yeah, another great bag that I love very much. I love all of these. Like looking back, I feel like I'm talking, talking you guys through little moments of my life. I'm a little cheesy. All right, let's move on to a couple iconic Marc Jacob collection pieces. This is another bag that did not leave my arm for a good two or three years, I would say. How beautiful is this? Some of the bags here, I don't know the names of, so forgive me in advance. If you know them though, please let me know in the comment box below. I would love to, um, you know, know the names of the things I own. But this one, I don't know if you could see it properly on camera. It's this beautiful crinkled leather and the LV monogram is actually stitched. It's absolutely stunning. The strap is this beautiful uh, twisted leather and then there's little sort of art deco contemporary touches over here. It kind of looks like mother of pearl, but it's not. And I love the little frills. This is a bag that was of course very popular when those huge boho bags came in style thanks to the Nicole Ridgies and the Rachel Zoes of the world. And this one, as I said, did not leave the crook of my arm for a good two years. I remember traveling a lot with this one. Honestly, so many, so many, so many fond and not so fond memories. I used to be a lot rougher on my bag I am now and definitely the earlier ones I purchased you can see that love <laughs> uh, years later but I definitely try now to keep them in great condition and keep them stuffed and keep them well loved so yeah this one was a really special one and I feel like it's a unique piece I don't see it often on the resale market so definitely love this one now a similar bag is this and the perforated leather this is also a very beloved leather in the Louis Vuitton family another one that I wore non-stop for a few years I think I graduated from this one and then wanted something a little bit more sturdy so it came came to school with me, it came to parties with me, it came to clubs with me. Poor thing. <laughs> Color is beautiful, it's this great sort of chalk shade so it goes great with warm neutrals and cool neutrals. The hardware even has seen better days. But then again, bags are made to be worn so I'm happy that these got a lot of love over the years. Inside you have this little drawstring that keeps it together, there's a little zipper pocket as well. So yeah, I feel like these two represent a really sort of special era in my life, like young adulthood, late teenhood, and I love them to pieces. They, they treated me well, so I'm trying to do the same back now. Another similar sort of style bag from that whole bohemian reemergence that was the early 2000s is this guy. This is another well-known model that they don't make anymore. I do not know the name, unfortunately. I loved the shape. I loved the little pocket over here. We loved a big bag at the time. So a lot of these serve sort of similar purposes. Also, if I'm not mistaken, I think this was my first big monogram bag and I loved it a ton. So you could have seen me wearing this in like 2006 uh, with like a pair of wedges 
wedges and like a denim skirt and then a low rise belt. Thinking about it, it doesn't feel so wonderful right now, but it really was a great time, I swear. I do love this bag. I feel like it stands the test of time. Now, another older style bag from a Marc Jacobs collection, this basket, oversized, sort of my take on a Neverfull. I don't actually own a Neverfull. How funny is that? I saw it, I loved it. I carried my life in it for a few years. My computer fit in this bag, so it definitely, again, got a lot of wear and tear. It's got this great sort of patent leather faux croc detail, which I love. I've always loved shiny red leather moments. We've, if you watch this whole collection, I feel like I repeat myself like an old lady. You've heard me say the same thing a hundred times, but I guess it must be true. Uh, this became my travel bag for years. Super, super practical, though it is an open, an open concept bag. It has some great pockets in there and it sat on top of my carry-on every time we traveled. It's just, I think it's still really beautiful, honestly. I don't know if it works in the context of today's sort of trends and style, but I'm not mad at it at all. I think she's a really pretty lady. So while we're on the topic of travel, I figured I'd run with it. Oh my God, what's in here? So this little Louis carry-on, she has yet to disappoint. Leather has definitely seen some water, some stainage. It's, you know, it's been places. So the hardware reflects that. But let me tell you, there is a reason why the brand's roots are cemented in travel. Uh, they are the best. I have a little carry-on from Chanel that I, I would not treat the same way as I do this one. She's a tough little lady. And honestly, the compartments are super, super easy to use. Could probably use a little, a little love like the... The zipper here is a little twisted, but honestly, so this bag has stood the test of time. I have had no issues with it. And at the time, I think I bought it for $900. Don't hate me, I know, isn't that crazy? So yeah, this is definitely a classic that is worth the investment. Oh, what's in here? Oh, this is kind of cute. A Simulé Rouge in New York seat. I'm telling you guys, I've been wearing this. Great, great purchase. Honestly, could not recommend it anymore. Speaking of travel, I had to mention the Louis Keep All. I have it in two sizes here. This one is as old as the carry-on, so in her, almost in her 20s, and it's held up incredibly well over the years. I got this one in can, I think probably in like 2002, 2003, which is kind of insane. And then this larger size is another one of those prized possessions. It was a wedding gift from my brother and my sister-in-law to Peter and I. We got matching duffels for the wedding with our, with our initials. So Peter has it in the black and gray denier, and I got it in the classic monogram. It was just such a nice way to sort of celebrate the occasion. An incredibly crazy generous gift and uh, they fit everything they are. They, they keep it all. That's why they called it a keep all. Now another more utilitarian uh, piece of my Louis Vuitton collection is this little backpack. I got the cute little drawstring. It's a really, really useful travel accessory. I, I wonder if it's called the Noe backpack because it does have the drawstring and kind of the bucket, the bucket design. It has two great front pockets as well for like things you need to access quickly like your phone, your passport, things like that. And uh, I think they still make this one. There's a bunch of really, really cool uh, backpack styles now, but I'm happy that I have something that's a little bit more classic with the um, canvas straps. I just think it's something my mom would have probably worn in the 90s and that just always makes me extra happy. So we're nearing the end of part one because I do want to split things up a little bit and spend a little bit more time <laughs> explaining every piece. But these last four are really, really special fun bags. Starting with when Louis went denim, this was a collection that screwed screamed to me when it was uh, initially released. They did the classic denim. I have a lot of shoes from that collection. And then they did the neon green and the neon pink and neon orange, I believe, in the bags. I originally purchased the neon orange one in a different larger style and then regretted it and returned because I'm, I'm, I mean, let's face it, it, it basically says pink on my forehead, no? I wore this in recent years to a music festival because it's definitely uh, very cool and trendy now, I feel, to have these kind of iconic vintage Louis pieces in your closet. Closet. I used to attach this big uh, tail on it as well to make it extra cute and kawaii. Look at how beautiful this tassel is. And yeah, this is like one of my coolest bags, I think, actually looking around, like what a statement. And I love the big guitar strap as well. Sorry, when I'm looking here, it's because I'm staring at the bag in the monitor because she's just taking my breath away. It's a really, really great raspberry color too. Really happy I stuck with the pink. Now, speaking of collaborations earlier, uh, one of the latest collaborations was in the early 2010s, maybe 2012, 2013. Louis collaborated with a lot of different designers from Christian Louboutin to Karl Lagerfeld and created these really fun designs. Karl made a life-size Louis boxing bag and then this sort of mini boxing 
uh, bag situation that you could carry every day. It actually has a little sandbag. I just hit myself in the face with it, great. <laughs> it has a little sandbag at the bottom to really maintain the shape. And the chains are super industrial to give it that same feel. This was a Christmas gift from my mom. She caught me completely off guard. I was obsessed with the Louboutin bag, which was pony hair with some golden spikes, which is of course super reminiscent of Louboutin. But Carl has always had a special place in my heart. I wore this so much, which is kind of crazy because she is pretty heavy, but it's a really, really cool statement bag. Definitely kind of a collector's piece. And uh, I'm really, really glad that I have something from that fun collaboration era that Louie did. Guys, we did it. Final two bags uh, for today's portion of the video anyways. The Louis Vuitton Limelight Clutch was and still is one of my favorite designs ever. This is Marc Jacobs design, I believe, yeah. And it was featured in the large model. I remember when big clutches were all the rage. So in the first Sex and the City movie, Carrie wears this exact bag in the bigger version in the silver. I love a bag that's kind of just a take on something that's an everyday item, like a paper bag. I feel like a lot of designers are doing that. Like Alexander Wang made a silk paper bag sort of style bag recently. But this bag served as my only evening clutch, my going out bag for so many years. A metallic bag to me is a neutral and it stands the test of time always if you ask me. So I love that this is, I think this is my one of my only gold bags. I absolutely love it. Uh, it folds over like this and then it's just one big compartment. I stuff it nicely, of course. But yeah, I absolutely love this bag. The corners have a little bit of wear and tear, um, but it's definitely a, a a love of mine. So many memories with this one as well. And it's a great, great design that I think they should come back with. In fact, actually at the time, this was the first of two of my favorite bags because the following collection, I believe it was that Marc Jacobs dropped a very similar large uh, clutch bag in one of my very, very favorite monograms or iconic Louis Prince, you should call it. The Leopard. Do you guys remember this collection with all the big like uh, beads and bobs kind of tribal themed a little bit? I have a pair of shoes here from it as well. I loved this collection so, so, so much. And of course, this is that iconic leopard print I talked so much about earlier. Another large style clutch. Uh, when I was living in New York City, I went out quite a bit and this was like my cool girl bag. You know what I mean? I, I would carry this out and I'd have my life in it, which was really practical, but it still felt sort of evening-y because it is a clutch. It's like a glittery copper. And then inside you've got lots of space for all of your things, all of your needs. So yeah, these two are like big sister, little sister, uh, tons of great memories with both, as I said. And yeah, they will never leave my collection. You could, you could quote me on that. <sighs> Guys, that was part one. I know I'm out of breath. I uh, don't know if I repeated myself a hundred times or were my hands like this the whole time or in my pockets. It's like I blacked out, uh, though I do hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, don't forget to give it a big thumbs up if you wanna see part two up shortly and comment down below which of these little beauties is your favorite or perhaps if you have a story yourself with a similar bag, I'd love to hear it. YouTube is a great community to do that sort of thing. I think that's what attracted me to the platform at first is that it's a great way to find people with the same weird obsessions and hobbies and loves as you have so it's been so great to meet so many of you also if you haven't subscribed already and you like what you saw today i suggest you do because there'll be tons more so just click that little subscribe button over there and on that note i bid you adieu and i'll see you guys in part two and the actual last episode of our bag collection series together so have a great one everyone and i'll see you in the next one bye <laughs>